Hello and welcome back to another episode of Boys Gone Wild. Another one. Another one. We out here doing them every day. Every day we on it. We on it every day. How often are you doing the podcast? Every day, boy. That's what I say when people ask. Oh, yeah. Is that a weekly podcast? Nah, it's every day. Why have you got the accent on? Because it's every day, baby. This, you're in English. Why? Because, baby, it's every day. Every day we out here making content. We out here making hot, spicy content. Um, I think this d- pandemic has really shown um, that people will make content no matter what, you know. I think no matter... I, I'd love to see... Imagine if World War Three actually went down. How would the internet respond? Because it's such a like, it's a weird, cold place sometimes. Like, if during World War Two, if there was like TikTok or Instagram or Facebook, there would be definitely be whole battalions doing synchronized dances on TikTok before they went over the trenches. Like the amount of memes there'd be about the Nazis and the Germans and the end of the world. Like, if there was an asteroid heading to to destroy planet Earth, and we knew we had, like, 15 minutes left to live, definitely people would start making content about it. I think it's definitely at that sort of mind frame where people are so focused on trying to be topical and have a hot take that even if the world was impending doom, it'd be like, shit, that's... Oh, God, do I have enough time to get a good bit out of that? Wait, we've got 20 minutes left. That means I can at least... If I can if I can do a video and get it out of my story on 10 minutes. Because, uh, yeah, I, I bet... If that we... All of us knew the world was going to end. I bet you could go on Call of Duty online. And... You'd definitely find some people there. You'd definitely find people online still... Still... still in the, I, I bet you'd still be able to play some matches. If I'm going to go out, I'm going to go out swinging, baby. Tactical nuke. I've realised that um, with more people watching Boys Gone Wild, that within the algorithm, you might get a YouTube suggestion for some of my Chortle Student Comedy Award videos. Uh, You're not allowed to watch those. That's unacceptable. And it's a... You break trust. If you watch those, then you're not allowed to watch the podcast. If you look at my Chortle Student Comedy Awards, then that's unethical. And you've breached the the bond of trust that I've spent 14 episodes trying to build. Because those things are incredibly unethical. Basically, for people who don't know, is a competition for comedians who have to be at a university at the time. And Steve Bennett, the guy who runs Chortle, the biggest comedy website in the country, goes around all the universities and holds a heat then you get to semi-finals um and then you get to a big final that's in edinburgh and it's a great competition because it's sort of one of the first real comps to really test like the new generation because if you win that it's sort of like you're sort of the best of the the youngest people you know um so i entered three times and so i've got the, the sadly the rule is that you have to like sign this before you start that um they they video all your every set on chalk student comedy they video and they put on their youtube but you have to sign a thing where they say you cannot we we will keep this up and you cannot take it down and when you're just starting comedy you don't give a shit you don't think anything will happen you don't think you'll even do it for a living you don't think anything like that will come about you don't think you'll be doing it in the future so you say fuck it yeah i'll, I'll do it um I'd rather, I, w- I wish I hadn't entered just because of those videos. And I'm not the only comedian who's plagued by a Chortle Student Comedy Award video. Like, you can find, s- or think of any British comedian who started young. They will have a badly filmed with bad audio video of them doing bad stand-up in a bad room. Um, I've got three up there because I entered three times. In the last time, I made the semi-final and did not get put through the final, which was bullshit. Um, 
But I'm not bitter about it. I don't give a shit, okay? Uh, I did nearly quit comedy after it because I was so pissed off. But that's not relevant. That's not why we're talking. Um, but the first one is so bad for so many reasons because it was my third ever gig. So there's now a clip out there of me doing my third ever gig. And it's one of the things that comes up in suggested videos. And it's fucking... My hair, I literally look like a paedophile. Because I look old. I literally look old for my age. I'm 23 and I look 32. But when I was 20... I think I was 19 when I did that. When I was 19, I looked 36. So like I've, I look younger now because I've sorted out. And I was going through a lot of shit. I think I wore a leather jacket. Like I, I had that phase. Yeah. It's a real I'd gross, manky, long hair. I do not know what I was thinking. And the, the stuff is appalling. But now I can't get it down. This, the second one is fine, just like average. And the third one's fairly decent. It's good for a Chortle student um, uh, comedy award video. But it's incredibly unethical that you can't take those down. The amount of iconic comedians who have videos there's john kurtz he's one of the best comedians in the country and he's got a video of him being shit (laughs) in the chorter student comedy awards sean mclaughlin one of my favorite comedians he's got a video up there from like 10 years ago that video will outlast me these videos will get taken down before that one does um and it's one of the first things so when people search for my name in youtube that's one of the first things that will come up so please Do not watch it. I've been banging the new James Blake track. Um, I love James Blake. All his songs sound like that, though. Because I love you. But it hurts me. I am so lonely. They do all sound like that, but it's fucking for for a angsty white boy. Yes, please. I'll gobble up anything he puts out. I think his music is gorgeous. And one of my favorite albums of recent times is his album Assume Form. Um, and what why that's a great album is because it's a bit of a departure from from his normal stuff. Normally his stuff is unbelievably miserable about heartbreak, loss, loneliness. But this is an album about how basically he's found love and how uh, he's matured in his taste for love. He's matured in his views on love that he doesn't no longer sees it as something that has to be painful. It doesn't necessarily, for something to be passionate and a great love, it doesn't have to hurt. Uh, you can just flow together. The whole album's about him finding love and it just, the two people, him and the person he loves flowing together and that's fine and that love can be gentle, love, love can be peaceful. It doesn't have to be this wrought, painful, anxiety-driven thing. And it was a really important album for me. And then I found out that uh, he wrote about Jamila Jamil. <sighs> so now I'm completely torn because I can't stand <laughs> Jamila Jamil. <laughs> she represents everything I hate. Um, God, it's so hard because I love James Blake so much. And I dislike Jane, Jamila Jamil. So, well, I don't dislike. She just is so nice. She's got that Rupi Kerr kind of naivety. Like, I don't think she's a bad person. Uh, she just fucking sucks and doesn't realise why. She's the body positivity woman who... Um, she's the body positivity woman who uh, is incredibly beautiful and incredibly skinny, but just constantly appropriates fat culture. Uh, somehow she's the face of body positivity when she is stick thing and beautiful. Um but yeah, it's odd. I'm just I list those songs and they, they they mean a lot to me and it's a really they've really formed me. But then they're about someone who I can't stand. <laughs> like one of his songs, "Can't believe the way we flow." Yeah, and it's like I used to listen to that, and it used to conjure up visions that were very personal to me. But now I can't just imagine being stuck in a house with Jamila Jamil. So it's it's weird how that sort of ruined the album for me. Um, 
I've been watching a lot of cooking programs because I with with TV I have, we have to me and my mum have to watch stuff that we both enjoy. So it normally ends up being sort of cooking programs because uh, my mum's obsessed with food, obsessed with food. My mum and my sister adore food, and I like it quite a bit, but. Um, they're absolutely obsessed. So we watch these, like we watch lots of episodes of Chef's Table. Do you guys know the Netflix series Chef's Table, uh, where they basically follow the most incredible Michelin star chefs uh, and explain their story? Um, but when I watched it with my mum and sister, I kind of get a bit enraptured by how incredible these dishes are and how amazing the the people behind them are. Um, but then I remember showing it. I showed it to some like friends from uni. And as soon as it was on, I was like, oh my God, this is the most pretentious middle-class shit I've ever seen in my life. As soon as it's taken out the context of being with people who are obsessed with food, you realise just how fucking bullshit all of it is. It's this really highly dramatised sort of mini documentary where it talks about Michelin star chefs as if they're some sort of like political leaders who have led revolutions. And it's like, no one's ever heard of these fuckers because... They charge £350 per head. Like, even rich people might only eat there once in their life. But the way they talk about them is that they found the fucking cure for cancer. There's one episode where uh, this Italian chef, Massimo something, um, he talks about how he had this incredible idea to serve tortellini, but only six tortellini. And they're kind of, they're jumping, they're, they're, they're in a line jumping into soup. Why don't we serve something very provocative I serve tortellini only with six tortellini in one line they were walking into the broth so it's like they're, they're placed carefully as if they're jumping into soup sort of like lemmings um, and the way this sort of like all the food critics are normally these kind of quite overweight women with trendy haircuts and like big glasses because of course, um, they that most most film critics look like the slug from Monsters Inc. And he was saying, "Here are six tortellini. You have to respect each one." Um, but the, the house in close because the the Mission Star food world is very similar to the abstract art world, where it's so encapsulated in itself. Uh, that it has no real idea of sort of relative proportions. So the way she's talking about him is like, wow, it's incredible to think that Massimo must have walked through these doors 20 years ago. Little did he know he was about to change the world. <gasps> Six tortellini on a plate. <laughs> I just can't believe it. It's insane to think of. Can you imagine traditional Italian cooking, how they'd be turning in their grave if they thought that somebody would shake things up like that. It's just changed the entire way I perceive tortellini. The key word there is tortellini. Whenever they're doing these superlatives, he's a genius. He's changed the world. Just remember tortellini. He's changed tortellini for a very few people. I still eat tortellini the exact same. And the way uh, he talks about traditional Italian cooking, well, they hated me for serving so little tortellini. Imagine what the, what the locals, they were thinking about us. They want me dead. You know, you cannot mess with grandmother recipe. Because you do not go against mama's cooking. And I don't know how much that's true because it seems ridiculous that anyone get angry because you're serving a small amount of tortellini. Well, I mean, Italy's the one place in the world where you can imagine people getting furious <laughs> about uh, uh, about the numbers of tortellini you're serving. Um, I watch Chef's Table, but I also watch uh, my mum's... Me and my mum have watched this for maybe the last 10 years, so I have a very personal connection to it, even though it is shite. Uh, the show Master Chef, which is with Greg Wallace and John Turode, and, and it's basically a, a cooking competition where they get amateurs there's a version with the professionals but it, it's it's a, it's rid ridiculously edited it's like a reality tv show basically where all these people they do all these dishes they do all these challenges classic but it's sort of cut up and edited to the point where um it always look every single time in one of these shows every single time it looks like just as it's like right guys time's up you got to serve up every single time it's a mad frantic rush as if they haven't prepared it. 
Like, I'd love to see in one of these shows, like, just once someone finish early. Like, I'm sure they do the same in Bake Off or something like that. In all of these cooking competition shows, it's always this mad, frantic rush right at the end. Um, it's always like, five seconds on the clock, and it's just, they just managed to get, put the sauce on just in time. Like, I'd love someone to, like, finish... Yeah, I've, uh, and they just, oh, so what are you cooking? Oh, I've already done it. Yeah, it only took 20 minutes. Uh, and just have them just sit in there as everyone's just madly running around. Like, fuck, maybe I should have put some more shit on it because I finished really early. Uh, but ne- not what, you watch those programs, never does anyone finish on time. Like, have some better time management, some of you. Um, but my boy gone wild is Greg Wallace. Because um, I've always, like, Greg Wallace is a, fascinating individual it's insane i don't know what his appeal is maybe his appeal is he's got this sort of joe biden appeal where sort of middle england seem to like him because he's sort of uh chummy and like slightly relatable um he looks like an egg and he manages to present loads of stuff and get so many gigs and do master chef when he himself can't cook he's a greengrocer he worked on Covent Garden as a greengrocer, which is what my granddad did. Um, and he must be the most famous greengrocer in the world. But I don't know how you can go from being a greengrocer to being a television presenter as seamlessly. It's almost impressive um, how much he's achieved considering that he looks like an egg and he's a greengrocer. My mum is gets furious at the idea of Greg Wallace. And I'm like, I don't know. I sort of respect... I respect the hustle um, because he's presenting a cooking program and he's meant to be the everyman sort of person. And he sort of lives up to that role because he's a fucking moron. Um, and John Tarode is like an excellent chef. He's like world renowned. And Greg Wallace, the English guy, the John Tarode is an Australian chef and the English guy we got on the show is just fucking Greg Wallace. And the contestants, it's, it's what I like about watching the show is that the contestants spend ages making these dishes. They present them to the two chefs. John Tarode takes a, a bite and goes like, mm, okay, I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm getting a whisper of cumin. It has this very developed palate and describes with great detail and precision um, what he's tasting. And then Greg will just get his spoon and go into the pudding like, it's sticky, very sticky. Yeah, I'd have that. I'd have that for pudding. <laughs> it's very... I like it. It's sticky. And it's like, who the fuck... Why are you judging these chef's things when you can't even cook? How good has this got to be for it to be awarded a Blue Peter badge? I've run over time. Uh, I know someone commented that um, I say that every time. Uh, and yes, because it's the easiest way to end the show is by going, I've run over time. Even though I do often run over time a lot. Um... Yeah, that's the end of the show. Uh, I'll see you guys tomorrow. Like, subscribe. Uh, watch the other podcast. Tell your friends, okay? I want more views. I want more f- subscribers. Um, and also, what what sort of length do you guys like? What are you guys into? Because I, I did the last one. I did was like 23 minutes because it was, you know, a bit more relaxed. Um, what sort of length do you guys like anyway? Do you like them a bit shorter because it's better or do you prefer it longer? I can't, I haven't quite worked it out. Um, But yes, stay safe. Um, And, oh no, before I go, before I go, um, I don't know if some of you guys have listened, but a lot of people are commenting on Billy Garton Jr.'s, you know, the motivational speaker, the guy who jumps in the pool every day uh, on his uh, TikTok. And what's amazing is that the rent has run out on the rented house that he's got the pool from. So you might be wondering how the fuck does this guy have a pool? It's because he rents the place and he's been kicked out. So what does Billy Garton Jr. do? He starts doing cold showers. We're doing it again. Day 123, immerse myself in freezing cold water every day. The shower will be getting a little bit more hate than I initially thought it would. But I know what I'm getting out of this. And for the few people who have resonated with and have taken action, you know what you're getting out of it as well. So, like always, we're training our minds to just do things by doing something every day that's a little bit uncomfortable. All right? Without further ado, day 123, here we go. Um... Go on his latest post and look at some of the comments. They are hysterical. 
I just, I'm so here for people. I could look all day. I could read comments of people uh, claiming that the shower's warm. I did a few comments myself, um, and I've, I saw, I saw a few listeners of the show commenting. So this is great. Let's just keep it up because I think we can get him to the point at least where he'll show uh, that he's switched the shower onto cold. That's sort of the start. But I want it to get to the point where he's going in an ice bath and he's putting a temperature st- to stick in there. Um, so yeah, stay safe, stay humble, and most importantly, think big, work smart. <laughs>